Hello. So we're going to be looking at how to use uh, domain adaptation methods to transfer from simulation to real world. So deep learning might, always, might not always be the most popular thing, but uh, we can agree that it has produced state-of-the-art results in uh, a lot of visual tasks. Uh, but one problem is that it requires millions of labeled examples. And additionally, models often are sort of have a data set bias. So for example, if you train your model to recognize pedestrians on a lot of sunny streets, and then you want it to work well in the winter, well, your model might not generalize, because it might have been specific only to uh, nice weather. So this tells us we have a need for adaptation, because uh, there's a common problem that you, what your model is trained on is not actually what you want to use it on. And this goes by many different names, and we're going to call it domain adaptation in this talk. Uh, so domain adaptation uh, can be applied to a couple different problems, uh, such as between data sets, as I mentioned earlier, or between different modalities, like if you have some RGB data and some depth data that you want to use together, um, or if you have uh, synthetic renderings and real images, and you want a model that can work on both. And the main approach we'll be talking about in this talk is learning a representation of your image that is invariant to which domain it came from. And specifically, we're going to do this without uh, hard paired examples between your domains. Because if you, have, if you know which examples are paired together in, in your both domains, then you can just use metric learning or Siamese networks or some other way of uh, learning your representation. But instead, we're going to learn a representation that's uh, invariant at a distributional level. Uh, and additionally, if we know that pairs should exist between our domains, but we just don't know which pairs um, the images are, then we can treat the pairing as a latent variable and optimize over it. Um, there's been a fair amount of work in this uh, sub-area of uh, deep distribution alignment, and uh, we recognize two branches. The first branch is to match the statistics of the distributions. For example, say that the means should be equal or the second moment should be equal. And the second branch is a more adversarial approach where you want to learn a representation that cannot be uh, discriminated into which domain the representation came from. So we're going to be using the uh, method in the bottom left, which is domain confusion, uh, where we have we were trying to fool a discriminator that tries to figure out which domain your image came from. So in domain confusion, you were trying to accomplish some visual task. Uh, and you want to learn a representation that works for your source domain, where you have a lot of data and a lot of labels, and your target domain, where you might not have as many labels and you have very little data. And in order to do this, you add an adversarial discriminator on top of your uh, final features of your, of your uh, neural network. And so then you use an alternative procedure where you uh, have to uh, alternate between training your discriminator to correctly classify which domain your representation came from and then uh, train the model to produce a representation that can't be discriminated. So the discriminator is maximizing its own accuracy, and the model is trying to maximize the entropy of the discriminator uh, to make sure it's maximally confused. And an example use case of this in autonomous driving is uh, where road segmentation, where if you trained on uh, fall images and you want it to work on winter images where they're still on the road, Without adaptation, the segmenter is very confused. But uh, with adaptation, the uh, representation learned ignores the snow, and then the road can be correctly segmented. And though this talk will be about our recent results on a manipulation task where we're going to leverage simulated data in order to learn a representation using minimal real world images. So we're looking at this task where you have to place a loop of rope onto a hook. And so this requires perception, because you have to know where the target is. And then you have to adjust your behavior accordingly. The method we use to learn a policy is guided policy search. This is a sample efficient way of learning a neural network policy. And uh, part of what makes it efficient is that it trains the uh, visual model of the policy on an alternate visual task, such as detecting the position of the target object or as an autoencoder. But this requires collecting a data set of real images to uh, pre-train these layers on. And so it's natural to think about how we can reduce the burden of training by pre-training on simulated images instead. Because in simulated images, you can just generate unlimited data. You get free position labels or object state. And 
So this would be a lot easier to use than having to manually label the positions of all the objects in your real world setup. So if we generate a bunch of synthetic data and use it to train the visual model for your robot policy, and then you try using it on the, for real world training using guided policy search, this is what you get. So the, the robot from, from training knows that it has to move its arm towards the hook, but since it was, uh, the visual model was trained only on synthetic data, it uh, cannot perceive the, uh, the hook position correctly because synthetic images and the real images look too different. So this tells us that we need to do some sort of adaptation in order to leverage our synthetic data. So if we collect a small amount of real data that doesn't have any labels, how can we use that to learn a representation that is useful for both synthetic and simulated, for both synthetic and real data? So we're gonna use, again, this idea of pushing the uh, distributions of the domains together in a, in a representation. And uh, since we know that the simulated data and the real data have some possible uh, pairing, we assume that there exists uh, a one-to-one -one mapping in, in our data sets that we don't know. So we say if we have enough simulated data, then in our small set of real images, there should be a paired synthetic image that we can find, and that if we can find it, then we can add these additional uh, sort of metric learning approaches or uh, to force these paired images to be close together. So assuming that we can find these pairs, then we can use a, uh, the screen just go dark? Okay, um, so if we, <laughs> if we have these, uh, these paired images, then we can uh, construct our network to learn an invariant representation by using both the domain confusion discussed earlier and a pairwise loss where we uh, force our paired images to lie close together in feature space. But then how do we find these pairs? We use a very simple approach, uh, but we, we think that you could do something more fancy if you wanted to, but the simple approach works. So we first train a, a target object position predicting network on just the simulated images and then use this network to embed both the synthetic and the real images. And then for each real image, we find the nearest neighbor in this embedding to uh, mark the synthetic and real image as a pair. So we're just doing nearest neighbors, but in a feature space that is sensitive to the target object position. And so this gives us near uh, pairs where the target object is in the same position, and we don't really care about the arm position because we want to learn a visual representation that's uh, sensitive to the target object. So now if we use this adaptation method on our uh, manipulation task, we'll see that the robot is able to correctly perceive the location of the hook and uh, put the loop of rope on top of it. So if we um, compare our method with uh, using the synthetic only data, then uh, we see that we have a much uh, higher success rate. And if we uh, use uh, randomly assigned pairs instead of using our, our, our method for finding pairs, then uh, those don't help. And if we use an autoencoder, since we don't have very much real image, since we don't have very many real images, the autoencoder performs quite poorly and doesn't uh, detect the position of the target object. So with using our method, we're able to use only 100 unlabeled real images along with 4,000 labeled simulated images uh, to learn a, a functioning uh, neural network policy that can detect the target object from fission. Some concurrent work that uses similar methods is uh, work on uh, transferring a quadcopter flight policy from one force to another or from one weather to a different weather, as well as a recent iClear submission that adapts for, between different points of view uh, for visual policies. Uh, some dirty laundry is that the task is fairly simple, and so it's, we're wondering how this could scale with uh, more interesting or complex tasks. And currently the alignment problem, the, the latent variable, the pairing, is fairly easy to solve because there's only one object. But if you had multiple objects that needed to track, then you sort of get an exponential, or sorry, uh, a polynomial growth in how many different uh, pairings you could have. And, um, we have not tested this in use cases other than simulation of the real world, but you could use this for uh, different adaptation problems where you just have different visual cases. And so our takeaways is that we're able to learn a good visual representation without real, labeled real images and that we don't need any hard pairs.
All right, thank you. Time for questions. Let's start with our respondent. Roy, where are you? Over there. So thank you, I really like the work. Um, I have so many questions. Uh, let's just do two of them. Uh, so first, um, can you say something about the breakdown of uh, for different losses of your results, particularly how good is your assignment of unlabeled uh, data uh, since you have the ground truth? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the um, there's a table with that in our paper that I don't have in this talk right now, but uh, we get about a six centimeter error on our alignment. So if uh, the the target of the position of the target image relative to the real position of the sorry the target object is about six centimeters off in our in our pairing. Okay. And uh, can you say something about your hyperparameters? So did you optimize them? Did you validate them? And did you consider any adaptive? Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so our main hyperparameters are on the weighting of these different losses. So the task loss is position, uh, predicting the position of the target object. The confusion loss is how confuses our discriminator. And the pairwise loss is how close are our pairs. And uh, we find that uh, our, we have to weight the confusion loss a little lower than the pairwise loss, as the pairwise loss uh, produces a lot more of the alignment. Um, but that uh, the harper, harper parameters are also in the paper to um, that for our best results. More questions in the back. Um, yeah, so you had this new oh. so you used like a uh, hundred real images. That still seems like an awful lot for that kind of simple case. How many do you did you need that many? Um, we did not do an ablation on how many real images we use, uh, but the key is that they're not labeled, so it's just kind of moving the objects around and taking images from the robot's camera. Uh, prior work required uh, 5,000 images if they, weren't, if they were unlabeled, or 1,000 if they were labeled. Uh, so we think 100 is uh, already a pretty good step down. But you don't have an idea if you could do it with, you know, yeah, I, Yeah, we don't know. We could test it out. Dale, could you come set up during the last question here? Yeah. So for transfer uh, of knowledge from simulation to, to real data, perhaps if contact is also involved, uh, uh, do you believe we need better physics-based uh, simulators as well? Uh, yeah, so here we're only transferring the visual representation. But if you have a good enough simulator, uh, we expect that uh, the physical control could also be transferred, although we uh, haven't worked too much on that yet. Thank you, Colleen.